Okay. Yeah, come on in. Sign in. So I said to some of you already, uh, this is not going to be a really interactive session. Um, since MATLAB is a licensed product, we don't want to use all licenses up, so instead you'll just sort of, um, I'll, I'll lecture and then I'll show you some examples, um, but you won't be really working with those examples yourself today. So let's get started. Um, I'll go ahead and start off by introducing myself a little bit, and that's going to go ahead and introduce the purpose and the, the um, background on this class as well. So. I'm Dave Godlove. I work at the High Performance Computing Center here. Um, my uh, area of expertise is neuroscience, and um, I did neuroscience work for about six years to get my graduate degree, and then I came here and I was a postdoc for two years. And during that period of time, I used MATLAB quite a bit. Um, when I came here, I wanted to analyze some data using BioWolf, uh, but I didn't really know anything about a Linux environment, didn't know any um, programming languages outside of MATLAB, and uh, so I approached BioWolf from a very MATLAB-centric kind of place. I actually um, replaced Bash scripting, essentially, with MATLAB scripting. And so that's the kind of the, the way in which I'm going to be teaching this class. It's focused on how do you use BioWolf. If really you just want to use MATLAB and you want to do it from within MATLAB, how do you use BioWolf from that perspective? I want to let you know right from the get-go, though, um, a lot of the things I'm going to show you today, there are better ways to do a lot of the things that I'm going to show you. If you want to take some time to learn Bash scripting, if you want to take a little time to learn Python, a lot of the things that I'm going to show you, you can actually do a lot more easily in those languages. But if you want to get up and running fast and you want to learn about BioWolf, this is a good kind of like gateway um, to start doing that. Okay. Um, yeah. Cut off a little bit. Um, so the class is going to be broken up into two parts, and the first part I'm just going to lecture essentially. I'm just going to um, you know, tell you about the things that you need to know in order to be able to run your MATLAB code in parallel on BioWolf. And in the second part, then we're going to take a break, and then the second part I'll actually go through an example. So um, I'm going to start off by talking about you know, what are the steps to setting up your code and running it in parallel on BioWolf. Those steps are going to be um, first, to start developing your code interactively on, on the BioWolf system. Um, then we're going to talk about the need for compiling your code and how to do that. Um, when you run your code in parallel, there are several different ways to do it. I'm going to be suggesting that you use the Swarm program, and so I'm going to show you how to write Swarm files, or rather, how to have MATLAB write Swarm files for you, and then how to execute those Swarm files. I'm going to talk about monitoring jobs, and once again, monitoring jobs from within the MATLAB environment. And then we're going to take a break, and then we'll get into part two, which is going to be a concrete example. Um, for that, I'm going to be showing you how to process uh, a lot of image files in parallel. And that is going to be, that example is, is what you've just copied into your data or your home directory. So after this class, you can open that up, and it should, you should be able to just fire it up and run it, step through it, and see how it's working, and, you know, it should be working code. But um, before I get started into the outline, uh, I just want to review very quickly a few MATLAB commands. Many of you might be very familiar with these. Some of you might be unfamiliar. Some of you might not have used them in a little while. So I just want to review them and, and make sure that everybody's kind of up to speed on them. Okay, so... Um, Hopefully you've run in at some point in time to this fprintf command. Um, it gets its name from the C programming language. So let's say I, I take a few variables here and I um, set them so that they're, they're strings. So name equals Mary, adjective equals little, noun equals lamb. So I've got three strings now. If I use fprintf um, with these escape sequences, then everywhere with this escape, uh, escape sequence, um, it's going to use kind of like a fill-in-the-blank sort of routine to, to plug those escape sequences back in, and that's going to print out to the screen, you know, Mary had a little lamb in this example. Okay, so a 
related function uh, is sprintf. Okay, so sprintf is similar. Um, we're going to do exactly the same thing, except now I'm going to call it sprintf, and I'm going to set that equal to a variable. So sentence, in this case, equals sprintf. Um, you know, these escape sequences. And now sentence is going to equal this entire string, Mary had a little lamb. So I can use sprintf to build up, you know, strings. Maybe I could have commands in there, um, you know, with arguments and so on and so forth. Another command that I use quite a bit that a lot of people don't like, but I'm going to hopefully try to make a case for it, um, is eval. So eval takes a string and says, whatever this string is, I'm going to pretend that's a MATLAB command, and I will evaluate it just as though it's a MATLAB command. So in this case, um, I'm setting two variables equal to these two um, chars. So notice that part one is six and part two is seven. Um, these are actually not numbers, these are chars. Then I'm going to concatenate together um, this string, ultimate answer equals um, space part one, uh, space times part two. And then I'm going to evaluate that string, which has been concatenated together here. And when I evaluate that, the ultimate answer equals 42. It equals six times seven. Okay, Does everybody kind of see that? This is really ugly um, because I'm concatenating all this stuff together with spaces and so on. It's a little bit hard to read. So the eval command is often used in combination with sprintf to make things a little bit easier to read. So this is the same example, but now I'm saying eval sprintf, ultimate answer equals two escape sequences multiplied together, um, the six and the seven. And so then the ultimate answer, when I evaluate that entire string, which is built using sprintf, um, it's going to end up being ultimate answer equals 42. If only we knew what the question was. And um, a, a related function that maybe fewer of you have seen is eval C, so eval with capture. Um, I don't really know if that's what it stands for, but it makes it easier to remember. So now I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to eval sprintf. Uh, ultimate answer with these escape sequences, but I'm actually now going to eval C and I'm going to set a variable, my string, equal to whatever the output is going to be. Okay, so that doesn't print anything to the screen, but then if I type my string, my string equals whatever was going to be printed out to the screen with new line characters and white space and all that kind of stuff. So you might be wondering at this point in time, okay, who cares? Why, why are you showing me all this? So hold on to that for just a second. I'm going to show you one more command. Okay, um, this is actually more just a, uh, you know, it's not so much command as it is just a symbol. So this symbol, the bang, um, you can also use system, the, the function system. They do the same thing. Um, in this case, say I'm in MATLAB and I, I type who am I at the command prompt. MATLAB doesn't know what who am, who am I is. It's going to give me an error. Well, let's say I I'm on the... BioWolf system or some Linux system, I type bang, who am I? Well, now it's going to tell me. It's going to tell me my username. You can use that in combination with that eval C that I just gave you. And I could set user equal to eval C, bang, who am I? Host equal to eval C, bang, host name. And what that's going to give me is some information about who I am and where I am. I could then take that information and then use it to, to do things in the Linux environment. So um, this little set of commands right here allows you actually to do quite a lot um, in, in the environment. So the bang will allow you to issue system commands. Eval C will allow you to capture the output of those system commands. Um, you could then parse them, and you can use sprintf. Um, to plug those things back in and make more commands out of them, and then you could you could you know execute those in MATLAB or at the system. This is a lot of what Bash scripting is. So this now allows you in the MATLAB environment to do a lot of what you would do, be doing uh, in Bash or in Python or Perl or some other scripting language normally. Okay, so that's just a little intro. Um, now we can start going along with the outline a little bit. Do you think there's 
any advantage to using the bang over pants? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I prefer it just stylistically, but. Okay. Um, so now let's start about, let's start talking about developing your code interactively. All right. So the first thing that you're going to want to do when you're developing your code interactively is you're going to want to start an interactive session. And um, for the examples that I'm going to show you today and the, the um, kind of the philosophy that I'm going to show you today is that you're going to be running an interactive MATLAB graphical user interface on BioWolf. You're going to be, you know, um, developing your code in that interactive session, and then you'll be submitting jobs through that interactive session and monitoring them and so on. So you need to know how to get onto BioWolf, right? Um, so in order to do that, you kind of have to understand a little bit about the cluster. Um, so every four months or so, we offer a class that's uh, all about high-performance computing at NIH. It's a really great class. And if you're going to continue doing this, you should take it. I'm not going to go into to detail. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of an, a flavor of what the cluster is like. So when you when you first log into BioWolf, and I'll talk to you more about how to do that, you land on a particular computer called the login node. Um, it runs on a machine that looks like this. It's actually a virtual machine. But the login node um, is kind of like your gateway to the rest of the cluster. And there are a lot of different users on the login node. Um, they are, you know, doing a lot of different things. Uh, but Critically, you can talk to the um, batch scheduling system, which is Slurm, once you're on the login node. So that allows you access to the system. If you're a, how many NIMH users do we have here? Okay, if you're an NIMH user, you've got the added benefit of you can use Felix. And Felix is Slurm aware, whereas Helix is not Slurm aware. So that's helpful because then you can, you can do all the things that I'm gonna be showing you here just from Slurm, or just from um, Felix rather, sorry. Okay, so um, you're on the BioWolf login node. The thing is you can't fire MATLAB up on the BioWolf login node. Because there's so many users there and because this node is so critical, you're not allowed to do anything computationally intense. So you have to ask the login node for resources, okay? Um, and those resources are gonna be CPUs and memory. And in our case, we're actually gonna be asking Slurm for licenses as well. Those are resources that we're gonna be wanting to use. Okay, those resources are not going to be um, on the BioWolf login node because you're not allowed to use the BioWolf login node. They're going to be out on a BioWolf compute node somewhere. So once you issue the appropriate command, your session is just going to be warped to this new place and you're going to have the resources that you've asked for. That compute node is going to sit in a rack somewhere. It's going to be in a BioWolf partition. Um, you might be familiar with, there are several different, so if you just submit your job normally, it'll go to the norm partition. There's also the B1 partition, which is made up of compute nodes, which we've reclaimed from the old iteration of BioWolf. And um, there's a quick partition for jobs that move quickly. There's a large memory partition. And some of you might have access to other partitions that your center has bought into. So if you're an NIMH person, you've got your own partition that you can use. If you're a CCR person, you've got your own partition, so on and so forth. So that partition sits somewhere in the cluster. And then we've got storage, um, which is mounted to all the nodes everywhere throughout the cluster. So on that, anywhere that you end up being, you can see your data, you can see your same directories, you can see your code. You know, all that follows you around wherever you go. Yeah, Brian. Um, you mentioned a bunch of different clusters that I can think about, like quick notes, like a quick job or a large memory. Uh, how do you know whether or not you should be sending something to those as opposed to one of the normal nodes? Um, if you type the command freen, F-R-E-E-N, and hit enter, you'll get a list of all the different partitions. And they'll give you things like the number, they'll give you uh, stats about the nodes that are in those partitions. So you'll get the number of CPUs, the amount of memory, so on and so forth. Um, the quick queue, uh, so really you should go to the HPC website and read more about it. I don't know everything off the top of my head. The quick queue is for jobs that are going to finish rapidly. I don't know what the definition of rapidly is, but I would imagine it's you know 30 minutes, a couple hours, something like that. Large memories, obviously, for 
those types of jobs, there's only four nodes that have a, a terabyte each of RAM. So they're essentially like a Felix for your own, you know, job. Um, let's see, what else is there? There's the B1 part. So you would use B1 if there's a lot of volume on the norm partition and you don't really need um, some fancy computational resources. You can get by with whatever's in that, you know, partition. Um, and it's not currently available but uh, when we upgrade to the newer version of Slurm, which I think is going to happen fairly rapidly, we're already running it in the, in the development um, mode, you can actually submit to multiple partitions with a comma-separated list. And so let's say I, I want to utilize both the norm and the B1 partition. I can give it both those arguments, and then my job will split up and run on whatever's you know available at any given time. Okay, so, so how do you actually do all that? How, what are the commands um, necessary to do all that? Well, the first thing you would do is you would, you would issue some sort of an SSH command or you would use an SSH client or something in order to actually uh, get to that BioWolf login node. You're then gonna enter this S interactive command with some arguments, and I'm, I'm gonna go through these in a little bit more detail. You're then gonna load the module from MATLAB and then after that, you'll actually fire MATLAB up. This is how you can start an interactive session on BioWolf. Are these slides going to be available? Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, definitely. I'm going to put all these up on the website. Um, the, the last class, excuse me, uh, slides are, are very similar. They're already up on the website. Yeah, so you don't have to memorize all this stuff. <laughs> um, so when you use SSH, you're going to want to use this dash Y argument. That's going to set up your X Windows environment to allow you to see the graphical user interface. Um, and you might not actually type this at a command prompt. It kind of depends on what operating system you're using and what client you're using. Um, you might be using something like PuTTY, X132. I don't. I think you just. Those are more like GUIs. You just click on something after you set it up, and it gives you a terminal. Uh, X quartz, you would actually use this. Um, and if you haven't started using No Machine, uh, you should all, I'm gonna show you No Machine a little bit later on. You should all um, at least look into this. When you're programming, like at home, when you wanna log in to an interactive session and start messing around and, and you know programming something up, No Machine's a lot faster. So if you're experienced that you got that like lag in MATLAB when you're trying to program, or if, you know, you're going to experience it if you haven't, um, over, a, over a slow connection, no machine is actually very helpful. And this is a website you can go to learn, you know, how to install any of these on your system and, you know, what the steps are for firing it up and using it. Okay, so then you've got your SSH session started up. Then you have to type a command to ask for resources. Um, most, so SLURM, which stands for Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management, is the batch processing system that runs the cluster. Um, because it starts with an S, uh, most of its commands start with an S. So S Interactive is the command that you would use to allocate an interactive session. And in this case, these arguments that we're giving it, dash C4, we're saying we need four CPUs, and mem equals uh, 4G, I'm saying I only need four gigabytes of memory, whereas normally with four CPUs, it would allocate eight. And then I'm giving it this dash L argument and a bunch of MATLAB licenses. Um, when you run the example that I'm gonna give you later on today, uh, these, this is the list of licenses that you're gonna need to make this run appropriately. And once again, these slides will be online. Um, I'll go ahead and send an email out to all the, the people in this class with the location of the slides so she can download them easily. In this um, readme file, the plugged up directory, you have this copy, it has different syntax for the S interactive, it's dash dash white, it's MATLAB. Is that an older version? Or? Those are equivalent. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Linux commands have both a short version and a lo long version. And so that would be the long version, and this is the short version. Not on the cluster but you can certainly use it for development on your own desktop before you, you know, go up to the cluster. So yeah, and maybe this is a good time to talk about licenses too. So uh, um, licenses are uh, kind of a mess on the cluster, MATLAB licenses. So mostly, most of the time people come from academia and they had a site license 
and you know they don't have to worry about compiling their code, doing any of this stuff because they have as many licenses on their cluster as they want. They all just work. Um, we would love to buy a site license. That would be great. The MathWorks will not sell us a, a site license. They only offer those to people who are in academia, and they say that NIH is not academia. We're government. So um, they say that if they opened um, it up to government and started allowing site licenses to us, they'd have to do it for everybody. Um, so in any case, uh, I've been talking with the rep. I'm in active discussions with the rep trying to get our license situation into some sort of a better um, model, but right now it doesn't look like there's an easy solution. I should let you know that we are moving in the direction of not allowing uh, non-interactive MATLAB jobs um, to run uncompiled. So we're moving in the direction where if you want to run an interactive session, you want a MATLAB license for that, that's fine. And you can do that anywhere. You can do that in the cluster. But if you try to spawn off, you know, some non-interactive batch job and it starts asking for a MATLAB license, we're going to disallow you to have that license. Because um, what's ending up happening is that people are checking out licenses incorrectly or they're checking them out correctly, but other people are checking them out correctly. Their jobs are failing. Um, so we're having all kinds of issues because of that. So just, just so you know, this might be an important skill for you to for learn in the future. Oh, so I already went through S Interactive, allocating what you need, and then here's the license. Okay, so now you're on an interactive session. Mm -hmm. um, the licenses, does the website have a list of the shortcuts for those that, like, you know, it's image, it's image processing toolbox, but you're only writing image. So does it tell us, does the website have that list? So if I know I need the image processing, I can go there and find out what the actual name is. Um, you know, I, I don't think the website currently does, um, but I'm going to fix that. Right now, this is like a little known fact, but the way that you can get that shorthand, um, there's a licenses command. Let me just bring bring up a terminal here and then we'll have a look at it, if I can. All right, yeah, there's a licenses command. Uh, I can't look at both at the same time. So let me... Okay, so licenses gives you um, the total number of licenses that we have for each product, and it gives you the um, number that are available for use combined on Helix, Felix, and Cyware. And then it also gives you what Slurm thinks the current state of the licenses are. And this is often, often grossly inaccurate. And this is the reason that we're having so much trouble with the licensing system is that there's no way to get Slurm to talk with the licensed server. It's just not something that the developers of Slurm care about. Um, so if you want some more detailed information about this, um, it might be hard to see. Um, if you type licenses and then the, give it the dash V switch there, um, that's verbose mode. And what that'll do is it'll give you the number of licenses uh, that are currently in use on Helix, Felix, Cyware, and Biowolf. So that we have three Cyware users right now using the main MATLAB license, one Biowolf user, and two Felix users. Your question, if you want, um, yeah, I'm sorry that's being cut off. If you want to know what shorthand you should use, licenses dash H. Um, the help will give you all the short names of these things. You can actually use these as input to licenses to query licenses about specific licenses, the numbers of, of licenses you can, that are um, currently available. I don't know. Let me. Felix is the favorite viral. Uh, well, this this session is on Biowolf. Uh, yes. Yeah, so let me exit and then. Try to load back in. Yeah, it's working for me. Um, Biowolf is behind the. Can you log in from Helix to Biowolf? You might be on the internet. So, 
Yeah, the AirNet is not um, within the the AirNet's in the DMZ, so it's not within the um, the real trusted network. So when you guys go home and you want to log on to BioWolf, you have to log in through Helix or use a VPN. BioWolf is not open to outside. Helix is, so that's a quick way to get in for now. <laughs> Okay, now the reason I pause there and ask for questions is because this is a little bit more complicated. So the things I've been talking about up to now are a little easier. This kind of a lot of times confuses people um, at first. And so that is, once you compile your code, it's only going to accept strings as input. And don't worry about that. It might make you panic at first, but there are ways around that. And I'm going to show you some ways around that. Um, so what do I mean by that, first off? Okay, well, let's say you've got input one, input two, and then, you know, all the way up to input N. Um, let's give it a, a concrete example. Let's say I'm going to, my first input is going to be a three. My second is going to be a vector of one, two, and five. My third one is going to be, um, a, you know, a cell array. So this, this isn't even going to work um, because there's white space in there. Uh, but let's just pretend for a second that that did work and it didn't throw some weird error. Once you actually get into MATLAB, this is what MATLAB is going to think that you just did. It's going to say you called my function with a char, three, um, and with a couple of strings, one of them having some white space and some square brackets and another one having some commas. Um, that's actually not that big of a deal, though, if your code is prepared that if it sees one of these strings, it needs to convert that back into whatever you intended it to be. Okay, so um, your code has to be ready that if it gets, if it's if it, expecting a double, and it gets a char, then it's going to say, no, input one is supposed to be a double, so input one equals char to double input one. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, this looks a little uglier, but it's a lot more flexible. And I'm going to be showing you instances in which the first will not work, in which the second will work. So what we're doing here, forget about the eval for a second, just think about the sprintf. So sprintf input one equals the contents of input one. Right? So once we construct this string, it's going to say input one equals three. And then if we evaluate that like a command, um, it's going to say input one equals three. And then our input one is magically going to be a double called three. Okay, is that clear? Because I'm going to be talking about that a lot. No? Okay. Um. So. Is the first part clear? Why your your compiled code only accepts strings as input? Uh, you used for example when you put the uh, event menu or you put the variable. So that that is going to be a char. So so input one is it's not a variable. It's, it's going to come in as a char. So let's say let's say. that input one would be a special name. That would be the name of a particular variable. And that's how this would work, is it would be looking for the name of a particular variable, which is the position that variable comes in as. And then it's going to say, okay, well, given this name or given this position, uh, which in MATLAB, in, in the functions I'm going to show you are the same thing, um, it's going to convert that back into its what it literally is. So what is the maximum number of entries? Oh, I have no idea. Uh, more than you will need. Yeah, I, I would imagine. Uh, yes, more than you will need because I'm going to show you, if you're thinking about passing vectors or arrays or things that are really, really large, I'm going to show you a better way to do that. And uh, so, S3F, the result is a string. Right. right. And if I what, what does Eval, eval, we went through this at the beginning. Eval takes as a string, a string as an input, and then says this is a um, MATLAB command. Evaluate it as though it's a MATLAB command. So let me, let me just, um, so once again, let me just go through the whole thing. Um, so 
Bash is not a typed, I don't know if you call Bash a language or not, but Bash is not a typed language, if it's a language. Um, what that means is it doesn't have different data types. It says, I'm going to look at whatever you give me and I'm going to use the context in order to, to sort of figure out how I should treat these things. So if you get it, the number three without any context, it defaults to strings and chars. It's just going to say, yeah, that's my default. In this case, when we call this function in bash, it's got zero context. All it knows is it's passing some stuff to another function and whatever to let that thing deal with it. So it's going to pass it as strings or as chars always. So that, that's so yeah. Everything from strings to... Whatever. Yeah, right, okay. right. So then your function gets that as a string always. And if you're, if you're expecting a double or an int or you know, any other data type, you've got to be prepared to convert it back to that data type. So this example, um, if I was just to write, I'm not going to type, I'm not going to call this thing input one, I'm going to call it x. So if x equals three, note the, um, the uh, single quotations making this a string, right? And if I say eval, S print F um, X equals uh, an escape sequence, comma, uh, X. So let's forget about the eval for a second. What's that going to give us? That's going to give us, here, let me uh, do a little syntax highlighting to make this. That's a string. Uh, this is, this is a string. And then this part is a string too. Right, so this, this string, is going to take the contents of this and plug it into this escape sequence with this S for tab. So if we just looked at whatever this variable ended up being, whatever this variable ended up being, it would be x equals 3 um, with a semicolon at the end. Right? And then if we wrap that in an eval statement, we evaluate that, that string as though it's a command, and now our x, which started off as a char, is going to end up being double. Okay. And this is like the most complicated thing I'm going to go over today. <laughs> so if you get this, it's downhill from here. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and once again, so you might want your, you know, you might want your code to work at the command prompt or within the MATLAB environment and also worked in, in compiled mode. So you might set up a little test to say if is char input one, do this little magic, convert it to a double, but otherwise don't do anything. I've probably already given it a double. Okay. Okay. So you've, you've covered all the bases, you've thought of everything you could possibly think of, you're ready to compile your code. How do you do it? Well, in MATLAB, the compiler license, um, the compiler toolbox, ships with a function called MCC. So the way that that works is you type MCC-M myfunction.m, but don't use MCC, okay? Um, this is something which is specific to NIH. Uh, when you use MCC, just like when you use any other licensed product, it's going to check out a license to your interactive session, and then it's going to hold on to that. Um, I already said we've, we've, the Malloc compiler is really expensive, it's like 20K. We have two of them. We have two of them for the entire campus. So if, if you're doing some interactive code and you use MCC, for as long as your interactive session is open, you're going to have that license and then people are going to be upset because they're going to want to compile their code. Um, instead, here at NIH, we've written this, this wrapper function called MCC2. And so it's, it should work identical to MCC. It's all the same, everything. Um, except what it does under the hood for you is that it opens a new interactive session of MATLAB. Um, it passes everything, all the arguments that you gave it 
to MCC and then executes that MCC, and then it closes the interactive session of MATLAB, and so your license is only out for as long as you're compiling your code, and then you give it back when you're done. So if we all use MCC2, we can all use the compiler license and everything's cool. Um, right now, you still have access to MCC if you really want it. The reason is because MCC2 has not been widely used yet. It might have bugs in it. So if you find that you can compile your code with MCC, but you can't compile your code with identical arguments to MCC2, email me. That's a bug, and I need to fix that. How Yes. I'm going to tell you. So MCC2, just like MCC, sits in the MATLAB um, compiler toolbox. But if your cache is out of date, you might not be able to see MCC2. So if you can't see it, just type rehash toolbox and it'll find it for you and then you'll be able to see MCC2. Was that your question? So the .m file is your source file. That's your that's your MATLAB function that you are writing. And then when you compile it, that's when you get your run underscore x .m or .sh rather. Originally, we get the .m file and the compile. We get the. You don't get it so much as you make it. I mean, you might get it from somebody else, but this is this is the code that you're writing. You can use it um, either in the terminal or you can use it within MATLAB itself. Yeah, so it's a function in MATLAB, but it's, it also does double duty as a, actually the function in MATLAB I think calls actually the compiler outside of MATLAB. So you can call it outside of MATLAB or you can call it from within MATLAB. And we have the on file. No, you can compile code on Helix. The compiler license works on Helix. Uh, yeah, it should. It's in the same place as MCC, so yeah, it should work just as well. Stepping back to the beginning, what is the relationship of FireWolf to Helix? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, okay. So Helix is just one giant server, and it doesn't run Slurm. It doesn't run – it's just a Linux server, and it's got – I don't even know, 64 CPUs, something like that, and like a terabyte of RAM. And it's like the Wild West. Everybody logs on to Helix and just runs whatever they want to run and beats it up and, you know, use it to do analysis or to um, troubleshoot your analysis, just whatever you want. There's a similar big server for NIMH users called Felix, um, but those are just, just what they are. They're just one server. Um, BioWolf is, uh, it's like... I think right now it's like 32,000 processors, and it's going to be up to um, – we're buying another 30,000, so it's going to be up over like 50 or 60,000 processors pretty soon. So there's never a reason to do something on Helix, right? Um, some people don't have BioWolf accounts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, if you have BioWolf, then it makes sense to get in via Helix to BioWolf and then just do everything in BioWolf, even if it's something that's simple like that. Yeah, in practice, I very, very rarely, if I ever use Helix. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, you would type rehash toolbox if you can't see your uh, MCC2. Okay, so you're compiling your code. Great. Um, you need now also to think about how is your code going to run after it's compiled. So there's some options, there's some arguments that you can give the compiler to change the way that your code runs. Okay. Um, when you fire MATLAB up, you might be aware there's some runtime flags that you can use, like no JVM, for instance, which means no Java virtual machine. I kind of showed you that really briefly earlier. You can use similar arguments to your um, compiled code, and the way that that looks is you use the dash R switch to let it know that you're giving it a runtime argument and then the name of that argument, and then another dash R and another name of an argument. I want to talk about this single computational thread argument for a second, that's important. Um, so MATLAB wants to be helpful, 
Um, and so you fire it up on your desktop or whatever, and it looks around and says, okay, you got four processors here. So when you start running certain functions that um, my engineers have optimized for me, I'm going to fire up four threads to run on all four of these processors. And I'm just going to do that under the hood without you even knowing, and your code's going to run faster, and it's going to be great. Problem is, when you get onto a, a, the normal computational node, it's going to look around and see 32 CPU, 16 hyperthreaded processors. And it's going to be like, oh, great, okay, I, I got a lot of resources here. But usually, you've only allocated two. The default allocation is one hyperthreaded CPU. So MATLAB doesn't know it's running under Slurm. Slurm doesn't know about MATLAB. The two don't talk to each other. And so it's going to fire up 16 or 32 threads when certain functions are run that are all going to run on your one CPU. And that's going to possibly hang the, hang the, the node, um, definitely slow your code down, and it's going to attract the unwanted attention of staff members who are going to start emailing you and saying, you know, what are you doing? This isn't, you're not using resources properly. So to prevent that from happening, so you, there are instances in which you might know that's going to happen, you might want it to happen, but if, unless you're very sure of what you were doing, you should use the single computational thread runtime argument, and that's going to tell MATLAB, you know, don't, don't do all that, just run on a single thread and then everything's going to be fine, okay? Um, no display is something, so sometimes you've got figures that you're, um, yeah. And sometimes um, figures can really mess things up. Um, if you work hard enough, you can usually get compiled code to make and save figures for you, although it's a little bit difficult. Um, if you're running under the correct environment, you might, and you've got a thousand jobs running and they're all doing, you know, five figures, you might start getting like 5,000 figures all trying to be printed on your screen at once. And that's going to, you know, crash your system and possibly mess your job up. And so that's a, that's a safe thing to do. That's a good but question. You, but you can do, you, you can avoid the no display if, you, if you're not going to have five million. Yeah. It, it will work. Yeah. Yeah, I usually throw it in there just for safety's sake. Um, the other question is, is, if there are certain computational processes that are um, not easily split up into separate processes, then uh, but yet, under the hood, MATLAB does a better job of running them as multi thread and things. Actually, not running this is a good deal, right? It could be. You could allocate yourself a single, you, but when you submit your job, it could be, but you'd have to be aware of that and you'd have to set it up so that when you submit your job, you take the whole node. Okay. Because and you can ask for that. Yeah, you can do that. You can. There are ways to do that. All right. Um, just one more word about figures, too. Um, if you're running in a non-X Windows environment and you're printing figures, uh, if you set it up right, they won't print, and you won't get any errors, but you will still get those figure objects and that you've got access to through the handles and everything. And so because of that, you can actually save your figures as PDFs or as .figs or whatever and, and have them afterwards, um, you know, even though you didn't display them. That's, sometimes that's a, that's a pain to get set up though. Okay, um, I haven't talked a whole lot about the MCR, the MATLAB component runtime. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so on, on our system, the MATLAB component runtime, which is the, always going to be the first argument when you use this shell script, which is generated by MCC, um, it's located in this particular location, user local, MATLAB-compiler, and then there's a million of them. And you have to know what version of MATLAB you compiled your code with, and you have to match that up to the correct MATLAB component runtime. This is kind of a um, little thing that trips people up a lot, and it doesn't give you a very um, understandable error when you mix and match. So unfortunately, they're not backward compatible. You've got to know which one's which, um, and you've got to use the correct one. And you don't have to memorize the location of that or which ones go with, you know, which. You, should, you can just log on to our website instead. Uh, mouse is something. There it is. Um, and, you know, we've got essentially this table which, which will let you know which component runtime matches which MATLAB. Okay, and this is even more esoteric. <laughs> um, just ignore that for a second. So... When you 
you actually run your code? Um, once again, under the hood, what MATLAB does is it's going to make a hidden cache directory for you. And it's going to put all the components of your code that it needs to run into this, into this hidden cache directory. It's hidden because it's got a dot in front of it. Um, by default, that's going to go in your home directory. That's where it thinks it's the best place for it. Your home directory is on a network file server. Um, if you spin up a thousand processes that are all running in parallel and they're all running a lot of different functions, then all 1,000 times however many functions are in there are all going to start hitting that one directory and that can really slow your code down. Um, so to avoid that, because it's a network directory, so to avoid that, oh, and, and just to show you, if I go to my home directory and I type ls-al and I grep for MCR, th these are all the hidden um, MATLAB caches that I've got in my home directory uh, because I, and each, each one corresponds to a different version of MATLAB, so I've run a lot of compiled MATLAB. Um, you can tell MATLAB, though, that you want it to put that cache directory somewhere else. And the way that you do that is by setting an environmental variable. Excuse me. So if you're not familiar with Linux, Linux does a lot with environmental variables. They're usually all caps with some underscores. Um, and MATLAB running under Linux knows to look for this environmental variable called MCR cache root. And so if you set that equal to, let's say, um, temp, your username, and then MCR cache, that's where, you know, these cache files are going to be located. So, on a compute node, temp is local. Temp is not a, um, a file share anymore. And so that makes it run faster. In fact, temp is RAM. So this is going to make it run really fast because now you're actually taking all your code and just loading it onto RAM and leaving it there, and anything that needs to access it is going to be able to access it very rapidly. Um, I've shown you how to do that. So you could, you could set this environmental variable uh, at your terminal before you start running your code. You can actually set it within MATLAB. So here's a way to do that. So we're going to say user equals D blank. D blank removes uh, leading and trailing white space from strings. So user equals D blank eval C, who am I? That's going to end up being God love DC if I run it or whatever your username is. And we'll use set environment or set env, um, and then we're going to set this equal to this. So this is the MATLAB equivalent of exporting an environmental variable. So you could have that in some MATLAB code, which you know um, spawns some swarms, or you could just do that manually, um, or that run.sh file that I showed you, you could manually stick that in there after you make that. You couldn't have that in your MATLAB code that gets compiled, though, because once it is compiled and starts running, it's already going to be running with your local cache. It's not going to be able to change where its cache is at. Okay. Okay. So that's compiling code. If you're compiling code that you want to run many, many times, oh. um, you wouldn't want to put it in the temp directory then, right? Um, Am I misunderstanding what you're putting there? So, yeah, so the way that that's going to work is that it's going to make that temp directory, and that temp directory is going to be gone when your job's done running because it's RAM. Um, so, either if you're going to run it like on, in multiple sessions, Either you would always have to have a mechanism to set up that environmental variable, which that's why it would be a good idea to put it into a submission script, um, or, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just going to, when you don't have the environmental variable set, it'll still run, but it'll just put that cache into your home directory like it normally would. Okay. So it does, you don't have to, this isn't something particular about the compiler, this is about running. Yeah, this happens, I'm pretty sure, I haven't checked this to be 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure this doesn't happen when you compile the code. Well, I'm, actually, I'm pretty sure, because I, I just messed around with this last night. Um, it doesn't happen when you compile the code. It happens when you actually uh, call your compiled code. Okay. What's the cache contains all kinds of stuff. Um, it contains uh, binary versions of your code. It contains um, pointers to your code. This is one of the reasons why 
funny paths don't work because it starts, it actually sets up a different directory and if you've got paths that are being checked after compile time, it'll start looking at those paths and those paths don't look anything like, you know. So uh, it's got a lot of stuff. You can check it out. It's, um, you know, it's hidden, but you, you can get into it and look around it. Yeah, and, and compiling takes time. It takes licenses, so you probably, it, unless you change something, you know, you don't want to compile it every time. Okay, so now you've got compiled code. Um, it runs. It's great. You want to you want to start running in parallel. So how do you do that? Um, so I'm going to explain. There's there's multiple ways to do that. Uh, I'm going to explain to you how to use a program called Swarm, which is also an, an in-house program. You won't find that at other places. Um, this was written largely by David Hoover, who's a staff member here at HPC. All right, so Swarm um, calls the Slurm function sbatch. Um, so sbatch, I told you that uh, Slurm functions tend to start with s. Um, sbatch is the way that uh, Slurm allows you to submit a batch job. And so you could use sbatch directly if you want to, um, but Swarm, uh, it's a little bit easier. So the way a Swarm works is you give it a file, and on every line of the file is a single job. And Swarm just parses that and says, this is all the jobs that I'm supposed to run. Um, this makes things a lot easier because then Swarm sets up the sbatch command and then executes it for you. Um, Swarm's got a lot of options. It's got man pages, so if you type man swarm, It'll tell you all the options. In fact, there's even a mechanism for passing it sbatch arguments. So if there's options that you just can't get any other way except for using sbatch, you can still access them by a swarm by passing it sbatch arguments. And finally, if you want to start using sbatch instead of swarm, there are ways to capture the actual um, command, the sbatch command that was built for you, and then you can, you can kind of bootstrap from that and start to understand how to use sbatch. So that's a good way to start. Um, using Swarm is a two-step process. Uh, the first thing you have to do is write a file. That's a Swarm file, and that file is going to contain a single command on each line. Um, more precisely, you're going to write code that's going to write the file for you, most probably. Um, and then second, you actually have to call Swarm, and you have to give it as an input argument that file that you wrote or that you had written for you. Okay, so to do a concrete example, let's say, once again, I've got that function, run my function, or my function that I've compiled, and it's, I've gotten back this swarm script, run my function.sh. Um, let's say I've, I make a swarm file, I'm going to call it myjobs.swarm, and it's going to start four processes. So this is what that swarm file is going to look like. And I'm going to run it with four different parameters. Okay, so you'll notice that over here on the end, the, the way in which each one of these, these jobs runs differently is that each one's got a different parameter. Okay? So, so is that clear? Okay. So um, what you're going to do after you save this is you would call swarm and, you know, give it this file. Uh, how do you get it? The .sh file you get by compiling your code. .m file. Yes. You start off with myfunction.m, run mcc2-m, myfunction, and then it ends up giving you run underscore myfunction.sh. Okay, so this is only four lines of code. You could write this really easily in an editor if you wanted to, but what if it was 400 or 4,000 lines of code? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. This is the command that you would use then to submit this this file that you've got saved to Swarm and have it run in parallel. Okay. So let's say you've got a lot of lines, though. You don't want to write it yourself. You want to have it written for you. So how do you write code that writes the code? Um, so here's a, here's a quick little example in MATLAB for how you can generate a Swarm file, actually generate that Swarm file that I just showed you. Um, so this is actual running code. You can copy it out of the, out of the uh, PowerPoint and get it later and mess around with it. Um, so let me show you real quick what it does. So first I'm going to be setting a cell array equal to uh, four strings, param 1, 2, 3, and n. 
So then I'm going to initialize, initialize uh, an empty variable, command list equals um, null. And so now for ii equals one to the length of param list, I'm going to take um, and set command list equal to whatever's already in command list uh, plus run my function dot sh space plus user local MATLAB compiler space plus param list ii and then a new line. And so this, this is going to end up building um, all four of those commands in this case. Then I will open uh, a file called my swarms or my jobs dot swarm. <coughs> I'm going to open that with the um, W plus option, which is actually going to overwrite any file which already exists. Um, save the file handle. Then I'll use the file handle um, with the fprintf command to write a uh, command list into that file, and then I'll close the file. And so then if I execute this, I'm going to end up with exactly, um, you know, these contents in a file called myjobs.swarm. Okay. Is that, I see everybody nodding their head. Uh, yeah. And so here, this is trivial. It's only four lines. My job's at swarm is only four lines of code. This is, uh, okay. but if it's 400, 4,000, you can just add to this parameter list. And then this code, this, this swarm file is just going to end up growing and growing and growing. Okay, so um, now I'm going to revisit the, the uh, most fun part uh, that I talked about earlier. Remember that inputs are only strings, so we're going we're to talk about that some more. Okay, so uh, we've already handled the case in which these would be, you know, one, two, three, and four. That's very easy. We just turn those back into doubles. What happens if you decide you want to supply arrays as input arguments? How would you represent the array as a string? I think this is maybe what you were asking earlier. Okay, well, if you really want to do this, um, and, and by the way, you probably don't want to do this. Uh, an easier way to do it would probably be to generate all your variables and save them in files and then to give your functions a, a file location as an input and allow your function to load the contents of that file. And then it would know that whatever the contents of the file, that's where the variables are. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But let's say you really want to do this. Okay, well, there happens to be a function in MATLAB called mat to string, matrix to string. You can give param1 as input to matrix to string. I'll show you what that's going to give you here in a second. And then I'm also going to put um, a set of double quotations on the outside of this so that it plays well with bash, okay? So once I concatenate all that together, it's going to end up looking like this. So note that minus the um, double quotes, this is the command that you would supply to MATLAB in order to generate, I'm sorry, in order to generate this array, okay? So you could put something like this into your code, into your, um, um, your code that generates your swarm files, you might end up with something that looks like this. So um, Bash is going to be very happy with that. It's going to think that that's a string, and it's going to, you know, call your function um, just the way it ought to. But then you're going to have a problem when you get back into MATLAB. You wanted an array, a two-dimensional array. You got a string. Um, that looks like this. It's going to have this double quotation stripped off of it by uh, bash. Once again, this is that instance in which um, the string to double command won't work, or the, wait, yeah, string to double command won't work, but the eval sprintf command will work just as well on this as it will on anything else. It'll convert that string back to that array. Okay? Now, to get really, really fancy, just to beat a dead horse a little bit, uh, we could also do other data types. We could do cell arrays if you want, want to get really fancy. Um, there's no equivalent cell to string as there is mat to string, 
but you can write your the code yourself, and it's you know not really that complicated. Um, so in this case, uh, I'll be saying param string equals nothing, and then it's it's going to be similar to what I showed you before, where I'm going to be building up not a command, but actually the parameter string here. So for i i equals one to the length of param one up here. Uh, param string equals whatever's already in param string, plus a single quote. This is MATLAB's escape sequence for a single quote. Uh, param one i i, another single quote, and then a comma. Okay. So I'm going to end up having something in param string. It's essentially going to be all these with single quotes and commas interspersed between them, and then one comma at the end. Then I can take that param string and I can say everything except for the last comma, so one to n minus one. Um, go ahead and concatenate that with some curly braces and double quotes. I end up with something that looks like this. It's the command. Hopefully everybody can see that. Sorry, it's down at the bottom. <coughs> it's the command for making the, um, the cell array plus double quotations on the outside. Um, then your swarm file might end up, you know, looking something like this. Um, then you've got a similar problem. Once again, you get back into MATLAB after calling your swarm file, and you have to be able to interpret this string as a cell array. Um, once again, that trick that I showed you before is going to work for that. So eval s print f param1 equals, you know, the contents of param1. That's going to give you back the cell array. All right. That's if you're doing that, then you're kind of this, this, this is the kind of stuff that I was talking about that you can do in MATLAB, but um, it's easier to do in a scripting language like Bash or Python or something like that. Um, furthermore, if you're doing that, it might be better to just save your variables and files and then just load the files. So what that would look like, um, let's go back to the previous example of arrays, okay, because I can generate random arrays easily in MATLAB, just for an example. So let's say I want to pass this array. Okay, so I can, I can write some code. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to point this out. Um, I can generate that array that I showed you before and similar arrays, or similar arrays with this command. Um, rand4 is going to give me a 4 by 4 random array. I'm going to multiply that by 10 and then round it so I get random numbers between 1 and 10. Um, I'm actually going to be calling that down here. And so what, what now I'm doing is I'm saying I want four files. I can set this number to whatever I want. I'm going to um, name a directory, mat directory equals home mat directory. I'm going to say if that directory doesn't exist, if not is dir mat directory, make directory mat directory. So if it doesn't exist, make it. Um, for i equals one to file n, in this case for i equals one to four, uh, my param is going to be a randomly generated four by four matrix of um, numbers between one and ten. I'm going to come up with a file name to save that in, and that's just going to be uh, sprintf escape sequence dot mat. And that escape sequence is going to contain num to string ii. So this is essentially going to be 1.mat, 2.mat, 3.mat. And then save, um, full file takes a directory and a file name and puts them together with the correct slash in there. So I'm going to save full file, mat directory up here, file name, and then I'm going to stick the parameter in there. What this is going to do is it's going to make a directory for me. It's going to fill the directory with 1.mat, 2.mat, 3.mat. And each one of those is going to contain an array, a 4 by 4 array. Um, of random numbers between 1 and 10. So now I've got the files, how do I run them? Um, okay, well I could have some more code that says, give me the name of the, the matrix directory, the mat directory. File list equals what mat directory. Uh, many of you might not have seen this what. What's like dir, uh, D-I-R, it gives you the contents of a directory, but it's a little nicer in that it gives you um, uh, data structure back, and that data structure has some fields in it which are specific to MATLAB. One of the fields is .mat, so if you use this, you'll get 
not all the files, including dot and dot dot that are in the directory, but you'll actually get just the mat files in the directory. It's a little bit nicer. And then the rest of this code is going to look almost identical to what I've already showed you for how to build a uh, swarm file using a bunch of parameters, but in this case, those parameters are going to be file names. So this is, this is identical to what I showed you earlier, except for this line right here. Um, for simplicity, I just said file list II. Note that I could say full file, um, mat dir, comma, file list II here, and that way I could have absolute paths to each one of these in my swarm file. Okay. And then finally, I'm just going to open a swarm file, write the contents to it, and then close it. And after executing all this, I'm going to end up with a swarm file that looks like this. Or it could have absolute paths if I had modified the code. And then I can just execute that on all of those um, mat files in the directory. And note that my, for this to work, my function has to be written so that it takes a file name as input. At the beginning of the file, it loads the file name and it looks for, in this case, param in there. And then it will have, you know, param equals to the uh, <coughs> four by four matrix and then it's, it'll have some code that runs param. Some, some people are nodding and some people are not. So we have some time. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is this is this is the purpose of this class. So uh, the example that I'm going to show you, in the, so you shouldn't be doing any of this in the command prompt. You should write code that does all this for you. I mean, what I'm thinking is, most of us are very, very simple things. Um, why doesn't anything like that exist? That doesn't for you. So I've thought about writing. Um, yeah, I've thought about that a little bit. One thing I could do is I could write a function and hand it out to uh, users that takes the contents of a directory and then, you know, you give it the location of a directory, um, a script, and an output directory. And then it'll set up a swarm for you that'll run that script on the contents of the directory and give you output files in another directory. I've thought about that a little bit. Um, the reason I haven't done it yet is because it's, it's pretty easy to do it yourself. And it, so some people uh, on staff wonder why I'm teaching this class, right? Because if you're a viable user, um, shouldn't you learn bash scripting? Um, if you don't learn bash scripting, you might not be a savvy enough user to use the cluster the way you want to, right? So. There comes this trade-off of like, well, how easy do we make it? Do we just make a GUI where you can just press a button and fire up a swarm? And if we do that, are you really analyzing your data the way you think you are? Or what happens if your jobs run away? Are you monitoring them? And, you know, but I, I might in the future. I don't know. Okay. I think that's all for writing swarm files. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the only thing that's left, you've written the swarm file, that's the hard work, and you just have to call the swarm file, right? Um, so you can do that in the terminal uh, by saying swarm-f my jobs at swarm, but we don't like the terminal. We're doing everything in MATLAB, right? So you can also do that from within MATLAB, obviously. Um, it's the same command, you just put a bang in front of it. Uh, you can, we can get even better than that. We can uh, capture the output of this um, swarm-f command, and we can take that and stick it into a variable called job ID. If we do that, we're going to save. Um, so every time you run a job, it's going to get this specific identifier under swarm. This is how you reference that job and monitor it and do things to it. Um, we can save that so we don't have to, like, you know, manually copy and paste that. Now it's in our code. And so what can you do with that? Well, I'm going to show you that you can monitor jobs. That's one thing that you can do with it uh, a little bit later on. But another thing that you can do with it is you can set up dependencies. And this is really great. So I'm going to go back to the terminal. Let's pretend that we're not in MATLAB for a second. Um, you fire up uh, a swarm, and it gives you this, this output, this job ID. And then you would say swarm-f another job. So you've written, you've written another swarm script called another job.swarm. 
and you would give it this argument, dependency equals after any, in other words, I don't care if you fail or you're successful, um, and this is the job ID to be dependent on. What that'll do is your second job will wait until the first job is finished executing before it starts running, okay? But that's boring, let's do that in MATLAB. Um, so once again, we do job ID equals eval C, we'd capture the output of job ID, and then we can use eval with this sprintf command um, to go ahead and give it a formatted print statement um, with this escape sequence. The escape sequence is gonna be filled with job ID, and then our second job ID pops up here. Now we got two jobs, one's gonna run after the next. And in fact, with this syntax, and you can just type the same thing again and again and again, or have in your code the same thing, and you can line up one job after the next after the next. So you might have, for instance, so why is this useful? You might have, for instance, um, let's say you have data, you don't know what the size of the data is gonna be coming in, but you know you want your code to break the data up into manageable chunks and save it all in some directory and then you want to you know, run through that directory and analyze all the, the data that's in that directory. And then you wanna take all those chunks and you wanna put them back together into your, and you know, reconstruct them into a full um, you know, data file again. So you can run three jobs that do that, deconstruct the file, analyze all the chunks, and put it all back together again. And if you set the dependencies up right, then you can just set it and forget it. Oh man, that, uh, well it's going to be local, let, let me think about that, let me think about that. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry, sorry, um, number question, I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really an uh, uh, excellent question. So I, I don't know, I'd have to do a little research on that because it, you know, MATLAB saves the state of the random number generator and then, you know, it starts with whatever. Um, so it might be that if your jobs start even briefly asynchronously, then that get saved because it's, these jobs are still associated with you and your environment, your MATLAB environment. So um, that would be an interesting thing to test. I could test that quite quite easily. Yeah, and if they do start at identical times, you couldn't see them with the current time um, unless you get down into like microseconds. Um, yeah. So each job number is going to have, um, so Swarm is going to give you a job array um, where all the job numbers are going to be identical, but the sub job numbers will all be different. It'll be one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So yeah, you could add to the time. You wouldn't want to just, just seed it with that because then if you ran two sub subsequent jobs, then you come out with the same result, but you could add it to the current time. Um, let me, shoot, I started writing a list of things to do. Amend the website to give a list of licenses. And make sure, send me an email or something later, and um, I'm gonna send some emails out to some people that I do, that I know that do computational modeling on clusters, because they run into this same problem, and uh, ask them what they do about it. Okay. I think this is all on Swarm. Okay, good. Um, and so monitoring jobs, the last thing, monitoring jobs is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, so we've got, there's a whole slew of different commands that you can use to monitor your jobs. Um, I'm just giving you a few of them here. SQ is good for before your jobs start, so it'll give you information about your jobs, even if they're sitting in the queue pending, not, not started yet. Job load and S jobs uh, give partially overlapping but not completely overlapping um, information about jobs that are currently running. And uh, 
job hist, job ID, will give you the history of a job after it's already finished running. Uh, most of these take both the job ID or the username to just show all pending or running jobs. Um, you know, once again, it's trivial, but we, you know, if you want to do this in MATLAB, I'm going to show you uh, some code that does this automatically, and this will be the syntax. So you do eval as printf, um, you know, bang sq, and then the job ID would be the escape sequence here, or you could just use the user environmental variable, which I introduced on the very first slide when I told you to copy the code to your own directory. Um, so that's that's really pretty straight. Based on everything I've told you so far, this should be pretty straightforward. Okay, and then uh, when your jobs start executing, there's going to be um, two different text files which are going to be saved either wherever you execute the job from or in a different directory if you tell Swarm to save those in a different directory. Those are going to be your .o and your .e files. Your .o is going to contain standard output and your .e is going to contain standard error. If you're not a Linux person, you might not know what those things mean off the top of your head, but in MATLAB, this is the stuff that you print out to the command prompt, and this is the stuff that MATLAB prints in red to the command prompt. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, is there a way to suppress both the uh, files? I don't think there's a way to suppress them. Uh, wait a minute. Mm, you might be able to. You might be able to just send them to dev null. Um, I don't know. You'd have to check man swarm. That would be a that would be a option in swarm. Back to the um, path you mentioned a while ago. So, would you recommend just having absolute path for every script you call, or is it just that you want to make sure the right the path is right when you compile? Um. When so, when you compile your code. Every single um, function that your code calls and every subfunction that your subfunctions call, you should be able to type which and then the name of the function at the command prompt and be returned a path. If you type which and the name of the function, you don't get a path back, then your code's probably not going to compile properly. Um, that uh, you're mentioning not to, add, not to use add path and not to use CD during the compile. Yes. So instead of CDing, I think that you should use absolute paths. Yeah. You might get away with it, it might work okay. Um, but that's it's it's an error that I've seen people have before. And the app was generating the errors or was it generating it won't generate anything usually except for code that doesn't run. Okay. <laughs> but if you if you've added the path, um And that this is that's probably the hardest thing about compiling code is to make make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be and that all the paths are correct. Okay, so you guys want to use the bathroom, get a drink. Just a comment. I, you're absolutely right about that.